saying look and live amen page 257 i've a message from the lord hallelujah the message unto you again tis recorded in his word hallelujah it is only that you look and live look and live my brother live Look to Jesus now and live. Tis recorded in his word. Hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. I have a message full of love. Hallelujah. A message, oh my friend, for you. Tis a message from above. Hallelujah. Jesus said, and I know tis true. Look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. Tis recorded in his word, hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. Life is offered unto you, hallelujah. Eternal life the soul shall have. If you only look to him, hallelujah. Look to Jesus who alone can save. Look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. Tis recorded. Hallelujah. 
It is only that you look and live. I will tell you how I came, hallelujah, to Jesus when he made me whole. T'was believing on his name, hallelujah, I trusted and he saved my soul. Look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. Tis recorded in his word, hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We already sang for him. We sang for you, right, Tom? Oh, okay. yeah. You just because you weren't here and you, you weren't blessed to sing to Tom. We were already blessed to sing to Tom. <laughs> so, and he don't want to be sung to the second time. He heard us sing the first time. Endured hardness as a good soldier in Jesus Christ. <laughs> Amen. Well, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. We can be here again in your house. What a blessing it is to be with your children, your children here, with the, the family of God here in the house of God. Lord, worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We'll worship in our Father in heaven. And we'll give you praise for it in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. You can be seated. So, if you haven't heard, it's a state of emergency in Arizona. Yeah, there's a nine coronaviruses. For people with nine, nine of them. Three of them are confirmed. The other six aren't. They just assume they have it. Out of the three, two have been healed already. One still has it and is on the way to being healed, but they closed down ASU, so ASU is now closed down. <laughs> they won't let anybody come to the, the March Madness tournaments. You're going to be playing basketball with, with no fans. Yeah. Are you kidding me? These guys are like ding-dongs, okay? And they ought, you know what they ought to do? They ought to go work for Hostess so they can get in the package, hey, man. Bunch of nuts. I'm just telling you. They said, they said, they said, wait, I was listening to John Hannity, and he said, right now, there's more people sick with the common flu right now than there is with coronavirus. <laughs> and they'll have more deaths from the common flu than they will the coronavirus. Hmm? You see, don't let this, this fear mongering get you. That's all it is. They're trying to make you scared so you'll vote for somebody else because Donald Trump probably behind it all. <laughs> that, that, that's what they said already. They, when it first came out, that's what they were saying. He's behind it all. He probably helped make it. He met with the Chinese. That's what he was doing there. Putting together the coronavirus so they could kill everybody on the earth and he'll be king of the world. <laughs> I'm listening to this. I'm going, are they nuts? They're really nuts. They're really reaching out there. Amen? And uh, But see, uh, here's the thing I have a problem with is they have that Patriot Act. Patriot Act that was in, in uh, was signed by George Bush II. It's George Bush. And uh, he, uh, in the Patriot Act, if they if they decide that they want to quarantine people, whether you got the sickness or not, you have to go with the FBI. You have to go with them, and they'll, they, they'll put you in a stadium. Stadiums are going to be the place of quarantine. And so they'll quarantine you in the stadiums, and they'll lock the doors, and you can't get out. And they asked, I actually watched the interview with the head of the FBI, and they said, uh, what, if, uh, what if an old lady doesn't want to go? He said, well, shoot her dead. That's what he said. Well, shoot her dead. And they go, you shoot her dead? Yeah. It's it's gonna be it'll be law that she has to go with us, and if she don't want to do break, if she don't want to break the law. She wants to go ahead and go against our rules and our and our uh, uh, commands. Yeah. Then we'll kill her. Yeah. That's what they said. I'm like, well, this is getting down to the nitty gritty kind of a stuff, right? Yeah. So uh, I kind of sneak. I, you know, I tell people I'm sneaky suspicious that they're working up to something here yeah. with this coronavirus, yeah. because m more people die from the common flu than they do from the coronavirus, but yet they're fear-mongering people. I'm telling you, I saw people by the droves wearing masks in the stores. Yeah. <laughs> I know. You can't, well, you can't get toilet paper. You can't get all that stuff now. Cause they're, they're not, everybody's buying up toilet paper. What for? Right. <laughs> Why well, you guys are nuts? Well, see, that just tells you that their propaganda is working. Yeah. See? Their propaganda is working. See? Oh, by the way, if you haven't seen, uh, here's why you vote for Bernie Sanders. Because Bernie Sanders at his last rally, and I think it was here in Arizona, they had, uh, they had uh, um, Nazi flags there, amen. So there's, there's a reason to vote for him. 
he didn't get mad. He was en he was enjoying it. <laughs> no, no. They showed pictures of him and the Nazi flag right behind him and stuff. I'm just telling you, they're not hiding anything. In fact, they said the most honest person in the election right now on the Democratic side is Bernie Sanders because he's not hiding who he is. He said, I'm communist. I'm a communist, a communist sympathizer. I'm a socialist, communist. And, uh, and he fit right in line with Adolf Hitler because the communists, so many of the communists did fit in line with him. They, they liked the idea he was killing everybody, you know, because that's what they did. They killed more people than Adolf Hitler did. Uh, that's Dol Stalin did. Uh, Mussolini. I mean, these guys. Well, Stalin was a co communist. Mussolini and uh, and um, Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong carried, killed 45 million of his own people. 45 million of his own people. I'm telling you. That's a, and so and here, this is what's on the Democratic side. Stinking communists running for office. Uh, you know, there there used to be a time that he would have been, uh, you know, hogtied and drug out and never to be seen again. <laughs> Because we didn't, we didn't, we didn't want people in bondage. Now, people are like, well, you know, if we go in bondage. It's okay. <laughs> it's all right. That's because they tell them it's all right. They're they're sheep. You talk about the Christians being sheep, huh? We're sheep that have eyes open. They're sheep with their eyes closed. You know what happens when a sheep's got his eyes closed? What what kind of sheep is that in a stage of maturity? <laughs> Baby has no ability to think for themselves function on their own see but we're supposed to be sheep with our eyes open mature amen, mm. amen. you ronnie you had your hand up oh, you you just liked having your hand up or oh okay you had your hand up it wasn't important You heard about you heard about uh, uh, the hand sanitizers that stores were charging eighty dollars a bottle. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, man, get some bleach. <laughs> hey, use bleach if you have to. I mean, I'm not gonna pay eighty dollars for a bottle of hand sanitizer. A sixteen ounce bottle of hand sanitizer, eighty dollars a bottle. Are you kidding me? But I'm just, I know it's getting crazy. People are nuts. I'm telling you, there's no common sense in America. No common sense. And uh, there's only 600 cases of the coronavirus in America that they have. And, and I'm trying to think. Uh, I'm thinking it's nine who have died from it, mostly in the state of Washington and mostly in a senior center <laughs> where that it's harmful to seniors especially. So don't get it, Brother Art. So... <laughs> So, uh, well, I'm a senior, too, so I, guess I better not get it either. <laughs> Amen. And so, uh, but it's usually seniors who have health issues and uh, or any, or anybody else who has ser serious health issues, pre previous health issues that it's ongoing can uh, end up, it could affect them adversely. So, uh, but other than that, you know, they're, they're making a big deal out of this whole thing more than they should. Amen. So, uh, you know, it's just like saying, well, it's flu season again. What are they going to say? It's coronavirus season again. Mm -hmm. By the way, you know where the coronavirus came out of, right? What? No, China. Wuhan, China. You know, you know what that is? You know what that is, that city is? That's where they make chemical war, um, chemicals for the chemical warfare in that city. <laughs> Wonder where that come from, that coronavirus. Hmm? They said all they do is I was talking to a guy. No joke. This guy got my ear, and he, he we talked to him. I talked to him for a half hour, an hour at, at Fry's. We just sat and talked. And he's a, uh, he's a what do they call him? He's a he's a genetic DNA um, analysis or something like that. An anal analysis, I think it is. And but what it is is the same thing that they do when they want to take a virus and mutate it so it can have a you know, greater effect on human life. <laughs> and he was talking about that, telling me about it. And he says, none of those things have hurt anybody yet. That's what he was saying. <laughs> he goes, this coronavirus ain't going to hurt anybody. No. So, it, it, I mean, people get sick, you know, like the flu and stuff. And some people will die from it, just like the, the regular flu. And he says, it isn't going to be any bit greater strain than that. This is the, now, this guy works in this field. And I'm like, okay. And I said, I agree, I agree with him. I agree with him. So it's not like the bubonic plague, but you know why the bubonic plague got so uh, 
so much, uh, caused so much death. 50% of them, you're died from that because they didn't wash their hands and clean, take baths regularly and, and shower. They didn't do showers, but baths regularly. And they didn't, they didn't sanitize themselves. Doctors didn't even wash their hands after doing one uh, surgery and going into another surgery, and the people died in the surgery. Huh? Well, no, because they didn't know that then. The only community that was surviving that had no, no one died from bubonic plague was the Jews. That's because they, they biblically cleansed themselves. They'd wash their hands all the time. Wash the, that, don't just run, the Bible doesn't even say you use water. It says just run, put your hand under running water. See, it's going to wash it off your hands. Running water has an effect. You can put it into a river, a Russian river, and put your hands in there and clean your hands. <laughs> that kind of thing. So that's, that's the key. And then doctors figured it out during the bubonic plague, the black plague as they called it. The, they figured it out and they stopped. They started washing their hands. And they found out people weren't dying after surgery and they weren't getting infections. It was amazing. You know, what they're doing was spreading an infection from this patient to this patient to this patient to this patient because they wouldn't wash their hands after doing this. So now that's why doctors sanitize and wash their hands and everything. They've learned that over the years. So I teach my kids, I said, if you look, go see an EMT, they got a patch on their shoulder. What's the patch? They got a patch on their shoulder, yes? Yeah, yeah, well, I taught you that, didn't I? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right out of the Bible. That was a serpent on a, on a, a brazen staff. In, in Genesis, when, uh, uh, not, not Genesis, uh, um, Exodus, when Moses, when the, the Jews were getting bit by snakes, and God said, take a brazen serpent on a brazen staff, stick it in the ground, and when people looked up to it, they'd be healed. So they have that, that on their bat, on their their uh, pat, a patch on their shoulder. They still wear it. I saw one the other day. A guy was wearing. It, and I pointed out to the kids. I said they got a serpent on a stake right on his shoulder. It means they get healed. They're they're supposed to be healers. That's what that's representing. You know, coming to help heal you. Amen. Well, that was a picture of Christ. That's a picture of Christ on their shoulder. <laughs> that's what the Bible says. That's a picture of Christ. It says in the New Testament. As, uh, as Moses raised up the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they don't even know that they got Christ. They're bearing Christ on their shoulder. <laughs> I like to tell them it, too. <laughs> hey, I see that badge on your shoulder. You know what it means? I had one guy said, oh, I don't know what it means. We just wear it. <laughs> I said, that represents Christ. Really? I said, yeah, it's biblical. Mm -hmm. Really? <laughs> If it's an atheist, he wants to start tearing it off. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so that's what it's about. Yes. Tell him I'm feeling sorry for him. <laughs> Tell him I'm feeling sorry for him. I was just showing my kids on my, my – I said I busted my hand four times in my arm and playing football. And, I, and this one fingernail is always is deformed. And the reason it is because when I busted it, there was blood under my fingernails. And they took hot needles and stuck them through the, through the uh, fingernails to drain the blood out from my, my wounds. And that's to release the pressure. And so it deformed my finger. <laughs> so I said, I've always, always, that's an ugly nail. So let's put it that way. And uh, so, praise the Lord. So tell him I really feel sorry for him. <laughs> he'll heal. He's young. He's got, he's got all the energy in his body. God will heal him. Amen. Lord, take care of him. Yeah. Who's? Amen. So was Brother Tenney's. Chows, and their anniversary, in their anniversaries, and and, and and somebody else's birthday yesterday too. I don't know who, but it's someone in the in the world. What? Who? Oh. <laughs> All righty, but don't get don't get scared about this coronavirus. I know you're not, because we got Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Only fear the Lord, not fear man. Whatever man can do. The Bible says there are going to be wars, rumors of wars. There, there's going to be all kinds of things, pestilence and diseases and stuff are going to come along. He's, God tells us not to worry about all that stuff. Huh? 
See, yeah, the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse us from all that stuff, will keep us safe and protect us. All you do is stay right with God. You go ahead and get outside the bounds of the Lord, and you may find yourself in trouble. You may find yourself yielding to the coronavirus, hmm? flesh-wise. Yes, ma'am? People don't read the Bible, that's why. If they read the Bible, they find a lot of things out, amen. <laughs> yeah, what's it doing? They're all the same because that's what they propagate. They're all the same. <laughs> amen. Yes, sir. Why? Well, let me put it this way, and you're right, just about every election year, the major election year, they bring up a virus, have some kind of have some kind of emergency. You know, and, the, and you know, it's only started in 2000. Only started in 2000. Hey, yeah, Y2K started out right there. Maybe that was the Y2K curse, amen. <laughs> I'm just telling you. I know some I know some Christians who are all hot on the the the, the the world's coming to an end at Y2K, amen. And they had, but they had, they had prepared for for destruction. And I said, "Why are you worried about it?" I said, "I hope, I hope if they drop a bomb, I'm right underneath it, amen. <laughs> Go right with the bomb, amen. Explode. Hey, you know what? You won't know it hit you. And number two is, I'll be with the Lord. So why would I be so afraid? <laughs> huh? I'm not that I'm looking to die. I'm just. Look at. Why would you be afraid of it? So, so all these guys prepared for death. And, and they actually armed themselves and, and built up a, um, food, food dumps and all this stuff to, to, so they could survive for long times in the wilderness without civilization. And I'm like, you know what? Have you, by the way, I want to ask you guys a question. If we do have a problem where food is scarce, do you think you can survive on, every, uh, on the land around here? Rabbits, quail, unless you're afraid of killing animals. Rabbit and quail. How about those cactuses out here you can eat? You can drink from the, you can drink water right out of the, the swirl cactuses. It'll be a little bitter, but it'll, you'll survive. Huh? You get, you, in these trees out here with all the, the seeds on them, you can actually make flour out of them and make food. Did you know that? <laughs> so, you, look at it. Unless they take all your trees away and, and, and quail and rabbit and all that's gone. By the way, if a coyote comes to my yard and I'm starving, he's dead. <laughs> I'm going to eat him. <laughs> huh? I'm shooting dead. He's going to be, he's going to be, he's going to be fresh meat. I'm telling you. You say, well, I, I wouldn't eat him. Well, then starve to death. <laughs> I'm just telling you. I've, I've actually thought. I look. I say, we could shoot rabbits from our front porch. We have them by the droves in our front yard. I mean, I mean by the droves. I said, man, we could live off of rabbit meat around there. Huh? Amen. We had a bobcat dead at the end of our drive up there uh, a few weeks ago. Bobcat. I took a picture of it. I stopped and looked at it. Took a picture of it laying there dead. So I, either that, either someone dropped off their bobcat, dead bobcat, or there's bobcat in the area. <laughs> but you know you can eat those things? I knew guys who eat mountain lion. And they say they're good. I've never eaten them, but I, they say they're good. Guess what? If I was starving, I'll try it. <laughs> I'm not joking. Some people don't. See, we're in a society today where people would starve to death because they wouldn't know what to do. We're just, we're just a bunch of Hindus in America. People are starving in India, but they got cows running around. You know, dog, and, and uh, they, got, they got pigs, and they got all kinds of animals running around. They won't eat them because it might be my neighbor. It might be my sister. <laughs> they believe in reincarnation. <laughs> you know, eat the stinking cow. Save your life. <laughs> but they won't do it. And we got that kind of a mentality in America. If a grocery store doesn't have it, we don't eat. Does it, anybody, look at, you see, I do a lot of research and stuff. Does anyone ever know, what, does anybody know when supermarkets came into existence in America? No. 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 
1940. The first supermarket came in America in 1940. That's because they started doing away with farmland. And people quit farming their own land. It was starting to stop farming their own land until they made supermarkets available. And then when Piggly Wiggly, by the way, and supermarket, supermarkets uh, started coming, people started finding the convenience of the supermarket, so they quit, well, they quit farming their own land. They quit having their own gardens, you know, and growing fruit and vegetables to, and preserving it for the, for the year. So the supermarkets came in. So he didn't pass that down from generation to generation to can and, you know, and preser do preserves and stuff like that. And so now we're all dependent on the supermarkets, which is really the government. <laughs> Amen. My wife doesn't. My wife will preserve things, and she'll cook and stuff like that. Not like, not like you know, go get a box of macaroni and cheese at the store. Let's eat it. <laughs> and if they don't have a box of mac and cheese at the store, I don't know how to make a, any mac and cheese. But my wife usually makes homemade mac and cheese. Real cheese. <laughs> Not just powder stuff that looks like makeup that women would put on their face. <laughs> I don't know how it becomes cheese from powder. <laughs> Amen. I've never seen a cow give powdered milk. <laughs> Or how about, yeah, how about powdered eggs? <laughs> you mix them with water or milk and then fry them. <laughs> hey, they did a lot of stuff like that. Yes. You're hungry now? <laughs> You know, you know, my wife and I did research one time on grocery stores, didn't we, Rhonda? And do you know 98% of the stuff in the stores you're not, you shouldn't eat? 98%. That's a, that was our statistic. I mean, we went through every item in the store, and we wrote down everything that's on uh, the ingredients on the, the product, and we found out 98% of the stuff you shouldn't put in your body. <laughs> and we buy everybody buys it in here, you know, because that's what we're told to buy. Uh, well, I want cereal. Well, I'll buy this. But you don't read the ingredients because you're afraid you'll die. You know, you'll glow, glow in the dark or something. <laughs> We're destroying ourselves from the inside out. Amen. Oh, well, we have trust in the Lord. That's why you need to pray for your food. Amen. You pray for your food. Oh, Lord, don't let this kill me. Make it go down real easy. <laughs> With plenty of ease. <laughs> That's why you should make more pretzel bread. That's delicious stuff. <laughs> yes. Yes, sir. You had your hand up. Oh, okay. And we're going to do our prayer request now. I don't know how we got caught up on that, but we did. Miss Karen. Miss Karen says pray for her pile family. She needs to get saved. And uh, for her to love the Lord thy God with all her heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the church kids get saved, that are the ones that are lost. And for her to have wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And for five unspoken. And then uh, God, and God's will in those sons spoken. For Jacob and Diamond, their adoption, and God's will in that. For Juana, Miss Rochelle, and Miss Ashley and Leah's pregnancies and safe delivery. And they, each child gets saved when they come to the age of accountability. To accept Christ as, and for them to accept Christ as their Savior. And for Karen to meet Leah. And God's will in that. And pray for President Donald John Trump. <laughs> At least I know she's listening. <laughs> Donald John Trump and Vice President Mike Pence. You don't know his middle name? What's going on here? <laughs> but he's got a nice first name. Amen. <laughs> amen. Pray for them because they need wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, and strength, and for God's will in this, uh, this coming election. And by the way, uh, Joseph Biden's who the Democrats want. But the guy's a nut. He doesn't can't think straight. I listened to his last speech. I'm talking, I didn't know what he said. When I got done, I said, what did he say? And that's what everybody was saying. Even the Democrats were saying, something's wrong with this guy. He, see, he didn't, his speech before that, he didn't know who his wife was and who his sister was. He was confused up on the stage. He, he went over to his sister thinking it was his wife. Say, 
and he's done a lot of things like that. And he did something. He did some really stupid stuff. Uh, well, he said he was running for senator instead of president, but <laughs> and he did some other stupid stuff this last time. And I'm sitting there going, this guy. I, I have a sneaky suspicion they're trying to sneak him in. And, and have Hillary Clinton as a running mate, I'm telling you, and she'll sneak in as president, I am just, I'm telling you. I told this to, to a guy, and he agrees that it might be a possibility. You know? Uh, no, not, not Michelle Obama. She's, uh, I don't think she'll get in. It's Hillary Clinton still. She's still alive. She's breathing. <laughs> it's all she needs to do is be breathing, and she's, oh, she wants to be president. And uh, so, uh, but I think that's what they want to do, have a Biden-Clinton uh, ticket, and then Biden steps down, says I'm not fit to be president, and she gets to become president. That's how it works, you know. Yeah. And then the speaker, the speaker of the house, if the, if the majority leader is the speaker of the house, gets to be a vice president, that kind of thing, and steps up. And so that means Nancy Pelosi will be vice president as it sits right now. <laughs> America would be in really true a lot of trouble. I think then, I think then it's time to take our government down as we know it and set up a new one. And by the way, our Constitution and Declaration of Independence gives us the right to do that. You know that, right? That's what it's there for. And that's what the militia was designed for, was to be able to do these things. You guys need to know history, our history of our country. That's why they were setting checks and balances for everything. Amen. <sighs> if, you don't, if you don't learn history, that, that's true history right there. The militia wasn't a bad thing. The militia was supposed to be a good thing. It was supposed to bring down uh, tyrannical governments. See, it's even our own if they become that way. See, Hillary Clinton, eight points of what she was going to do in eight years, was to, the first was going to be destroy the church and the Second Amendment. The church was going to be outlawed. The Second Amendment was going to be abolished. <laughs> See, amen. They're trying to do that in this, in this state, by the way. I was just reading a survey on it. And they're trying to uh, abolish guns in, in the state of Arizona. And, and they, they had a petition out for it, 500,000 500, signatures they need. They have 408 in the state of Arizona already, 408,000 signatures already in the state of Arizona to abolish guns in the state of Arizona. And they give you the whole list of things they want to do under this, this uh, law. I <laughs> know. 408,000 people. So you know, you know what the survey is all about or the, the, they're checking? Check and see how strong it is in this state. And how much more? How many more liberals they need to bring in to make it stronger? <laughs> That's just the way they do things. They've done it in every state. Did it in Virginia. Virginia is now a Democratic state when it used to be a Republican. So, Amen. I'm just telling you, this is why you need to pray for our government. You need to ask God to save them or get them out. If they either get saved or get those wicked ones out of us. The government put up some good people in there, huh? We need to keep our, our government on track, and they need to yield to the people, yeah. not the other way around. Oh, that was what, that is what Biden said. He's talking to the uh, automobile industry, the union automobile industry, and all the people. One guy started questioning about uh, uh, his gun laws and what he plans on doing. And, the, and he called the guy a horse's rear end, but he said it in his manner. And, he started, and then they said, is that how you talk to people you want to get a vote from? Man, we're talking like you're listening. I was listening to it on the radio. And all of a sudden it turned into an argument. And they're going back and forth. And the, the union was yelling and screaming at him. And the people were. And you couldn't hear anything. They were just yelling and screaming back and forth. He opened up a can of worms there. Now you're talking the union, the automobile union. You know, the, 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 they're Teamsters, I believe they are. But the, it's a large union. And he, just, he may have just stepped on his own toes, yeah, man. So I don't know. <laughs> but that wasn't the only thing he called them. That was just a, a minor thing he called them. He called them other things, too. And they didn't like it. You don't just tell your, your voters, hey, this is what I think about you. Now vote for me. You know, if someone called me a, a lying, uh, what is it, Karen? A li lying dog face uh, pony soldier. I'm not voting for him. <laughs> That's what he called that woman. <laughs> And I'm like, really? <laughs> you are so dumb, 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 dumb. But these are things he's doing, and you and 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 he'll be he'll probably get the nomination because that's who they want. I'm telling you, he's in the lead. You know this, going into this next uh, primary thing or this next uh, what do they call it? 
um, you know what they call it, <laughs> where they're going to check to see who's going to get the delegates so they can be the running, uh, get the position for running for the president in the Democratic Party. He's leading. He's leading. <laughs> oh, my soul. Uh, well, she says, uh, Karen says, also pray for uh, our neighbors to accept Christ, for her grandpa Ben and Grace, and help them health wise, for, uh, for, uh, Aunt, uh, for Aunt Janet, for Janet Tenney, and Charlie Tenney, comfort in this situation with her. May God take away her cancer. Amen. They were at the doctor's today. I didn't hear anything about it. But he told me today they were at the doctor's. And Karen says, thank God for all the blessings that he's given her. Amen. Esther says, pray for Donald and her bio family to get saved. For Donald's health. And uh, also Jacob and Diamond's adoption. And for her to walk with uh, God. And uh, she said, I love Jesus and I love you. Love you, love Esther Bacinas. With the little faces on there, amen. James and Chow says, pray for their health, finances, media ministry. Chow's family, her mom, and their health and salvation. Do pray for uh, Miss Chow's health. She was sick ye uh, yesterday, the day before. She had a 101 degree temperature. God's grace and mercy upon them. James driving test tomorrow. He's driving big rigs, amen. And uh, God, and some people aren't even driving little rigs, are they, brother? Oh, Ronnie. <laughs> uh, pray for God's will in James's work, and unspoken request, and Samuel and David's salvation, and James the third spiritual growth and wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, amen. Robert says, pray for him to have a hatred for sin. And have wisdom and knowledge and understanding in all things. Uh, for President Trump and uh, Vice President Pence, strengthens to stand, to do right with God, to love God's word, and to love God's word. Then you got to hate all by itself. What's that mean? Just hate? You want to hate? You want to hate what God hates? Amen. Pray for Western Roundup and Youth Rally. Please, please, please pray for those things. And we're going to need some helpers on the 14th, which is this Saturday, setting up the tent. It's supposed to rain until Friday. Then Saturday is supposed to be totally clear and nice and sunny, about 70 degrees. Then it's supposed to rain next week, up until Friday. And uh, the Saturday before, uh, Friday before Western Roundup, and yeah, I mean Youth Rally and Western Roundup. And so it's supposed to rain then. The temperatures are going to be mild. First time since we've had Western Roundup that it's going to be mild. It's usually about 85 degrees. Uh, it's only supposed to be uh, about 70. So, so next week, middle of next week, it's only going to be upper 50s. So, and it's going to rain like we're having now, which I like. It's fine with me. But it, it stagnates our work we've been trying to do. By the way, if you haven't noticed, put a rod iron fence up around the playground area. Don't run into it. Or you'll get your fa little face destroyed. <laughs> you won't like it. Six foot wide wrought iron fence. And uh, yeah, you won't like it if you run into it. I told Alex after he put it up, I said, can you imagine someone who cuts across our property and has cut across it before and right across the playground, doesn't realize that fence there at night and runs right into it? You wake up the next morning, he's laying in the <laughs> parking lot. <laughs> Uh, we laugh, but man, it could happen. <laughs> Someone running through the yard, thinking it's uh, it's okay, run right into that fence. That would be horrible. I don't want someone to get hurt. But when you do something new, you you know sometimes you might <laughs> like putting up a wall or a fence or or you know you you do some gardening, put a rock garden in. <laughs> someone stumbles over and falls on their face. Amen. Amen. They shouldn't cross the property anyway, but you know you don't want them to get hurt. <laughs> And so pray for Western Roundup and Youth Rally and for uh, Robert's work and his co-workers to walk in the spirit, not in the flesh, and for him to have love and charity. Amen. Liz pray, says pray for her bio family, and they need to get saved. And pray for Elizabeth and pray for Mimi, that's Miss Lori, and pray for Dan and Rochelle and their new baby, born healthy, and Miss Rochelle stay healthy. Dan, stay healthy. Amen. I know he's probably going to have all the sympathy pains and everything, you know. 
He's got. He's already got the cravings to eat everything in the house. But I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I need some pickles and ice cream. <laughs> Rhonda's favorite favorite thing was uh, honeycombs, and then the other one was uh, golden delicious apples and and Malta, Malta olives, black olives. Amen. They're Greek olive, and it's kind of a salty, sour olive. But she loved those things when she was pregnant. Amen. Ladies like these interesting stuff, but I I sit there and eat right along with her. I think. <laughs> Amen. The brother Art says pray for the pastor and his family, for uh, Jacob and Diamond their adoption. Pray for Edwin Cruz; he needs to get saved. And pray for brother Art's health. And we pray for brother Art and our family. Amen. Amen. Pray for him. And Mrs. Grissom says pray for her dad and Jody, their salvation and health, and her mom's health and Robert's salvation. That's her stepdad. For her brother and sister and nieces all to get saved. And an unspoken request for personal for herself. And unspoken for work. And uh, God to be shown mighty in her life. And her have a closer walk with God. And to have wisdom, knowledge, understanding. And a travel trailer that God wants her to have. She's going traveling, amen. <laughs> amen. She found out someone has 36 acres up north. She just, you know, move on our property. <laughs> move on our property. That's all right. I got preachers already telling me that. If you hear a generator running, it's us. <laughs> you got 36 acres. We can just be on one end. You can be on the other. <laughs> but their purpose is the hunting. They'll be up there hunting. Amen. <laughs> all righty. It's funny too. You talk to preachers, and they get their, they get a hunting tag here. I mean, they get drawn for a tag. Everything goes out the window except honey. <laughs> We're going hunting. And that's the way it is. How do you know? Because some of my friends got tags this year, got drawn for hunting, and and they were asked to preach at someone else's church, and they said, "Oh no, I'm hunting. I'll be hunting. I won't be able to be there. I got a tag, man." And I said, "Well, you give it to your son. I'm not giving it to my son. <laughs> I'm going hunting." You know how long I've been waiting to get a tag? <laughs> that did happen here just a couple weeks ago. <laughs> and so I said, amen. I said, I'll preach for you guys if you need help. <laughs> amen. I said, he just gives me the meat when he gets back. Let him be out in the cold and freeze to death and get wet, uh, sit in a tree, <laughs> fall asleep. And, that, and guarantee the hunters are sleeping half the time when they, because they go, go to bed late and get up early and go out hunting, holding a rifle, and they got. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I know I've been there. Amen. So, pray for the Fazio family. They need to get saved. Mrs. Porter and Mrs. Tenney and Mrs. Hernandez. All of them gonna have health needs. Mr. Mrs. Tenney's got the cancer. Mrs. Hernandez got cancer. Mrs. Porter had a hip uh, issue with uh, and uh, replacement. She's doing better. Praise the Lord. Juana, Rochelle, Ashley, and Leah's pregnancy. Uh, Leroy Sr. and Jr., their spiritual protection. And uh, Western Roundup Youth Rally. And the Accurate family, safety for them. Amen. James the Third says, uh, pray for his brother and sister to come here. Yeah, they need some spiritual help, I'm telling you. Uh, for his dog to be a really good dog. <laughs> you're talking about you're talking about Bella? They ain't, they know. That's a miracle by God if that happens. <laughs> Huh? I know. <laughs> well, at least it wasn't underneath the car. <laughs> that could have been that. It could have been what happened. That dog is. I think Satan's in that dog. <laughs> James wants to gain some wisdom. <laughs> And for David to learn to walk so he can be uh, more fun, more fun. <laughs> we, we, no, we have the cameras around here. David snuck out of bed. And I was told David had gotten out of bed. And they don't know how long he was out of bed, but he was in the dog dish eating the dog food, playing in the water and stuff. So I said, let me get on the camera. He did. He got out of bed on his own and watched him go under the table. I watched him go over to the dog food, and he was throwing it everywhere and eating pieces here and there. And he playing and everything. And I said, look at it. Eight minutes he played. <laughs> I timed it because I got a clock on there, and I timed it. I go, eight minutes. 
Huh? Now, he wasn't supposed to be up. His mom was in bed. <laughs> and I watched him play with that food and eat it. And then Faith caught him. <laughs> she heard him, him, him going and cooing and all this stuff. And, and uh, when, you know, when you put a kid in bed, James used to do the same thing. Your dad used to do the same thing. And all of a sudden, he come out of his bedroom. He's like a year and a half old. How did he get out of bed? He's in a crib, okay? Got the high sides on it and everything. And so we decided we'd, uh, we'd uh, watch him, put him in bed, and he did a flip out, of the, flip out of the bed. He didn't climb out. He did a flip. He grabbed the bars and did a, a head over heels flip and landed on his feet and come walking out of the bedroom. <laughs> like, like, hey, I'm here. <laughs> well, Elijah did the same thing wherever he's at right there. Elijah. I said, you did the same thing, Elijah. You were only about a year, a little over a year, and you did the same thing. And I said, kids are versatile. <laughs> oh, Danny Rochelle says, play for the uh, Kalpana family. Amen. They need to get saved. Van, Van, Van Kesh? Going to go ahead, put other names in there. Is that what it says, Van Kesh? Is that a German? It sounds German. Is it really? Uh, as in from India? Okay. And then the Kyra, Kyra, you know, I was going to say Kyra, but there was an A in there. Kyra's salvation, all five, three of those families. And if you want the spelling, ask Dan and Rochelle. Amen. Pray for Dan and Rochelle and other mothers who are pregnant. They're self-pregnancies, self -pregnancies. safe pregnancies. You never know how I'm going to pray to God about this. <laughs> Me and God having a laugh right now, amen. <laughs> Pray for the church kids' salvation. The missionaries in Yuma. Who's the missionary in Yuma? Veldheis. Veldheis. It's German, too. Veldheis. Uh, it's Michael Veldheis. And uh, he's the one that had gotten in a car wreck, was in a coma for five months, got, had a stroke, had a heart attack, has cancer, on and down, and he's still on the mission field. That guy's been taking a beating physically, but he's still out there spiritually, amen. And um, I, I, those are the kind of guys I like, you know. Huh? He had, he had cancer. He went through chemo. I don't know. I haven't heard any report, but his son-in-law is coming and working with him. He's probably, uh, my guess is he's probably going to take over the ministry there, but they're working with American Indians there. The Kokopal Indians? Kokopal? Kokopal Indians. So, and, uh, and they want, Dan and Rochelle want more love for the Lord, for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And blessings from the Lord. I thought it said blessings him, the Lord, but it says this must be Dan's writing. I'm tired. No, oh, that's an excuse. <laughs> that's an excuse. What's Ronnie's? <laughs> he must have been tired from the beginning to the end. <laughs> Doris says, "Praise the Lord, she's saved." Thank you, Jesus, for your love and mercy you have for me and my brothers and sisters in you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Don't forget coming Saturday for the youth uh, for the uh, setting up the tent for the youth rally in West Roundup. And uh, we're going to need help setting up the tent. So uh, don't forget about that. I'm just putting that out there again so we have some help. Amen. Yes, sir? Probably 9 o'clock. That's what time we usually do. You can come anytime. If you can't be here at 9, it's fine because we'll still be laying stakes out, tying the tents together, you know, strapping them together, whatever, unless you have that done by that time. Because you said something about the ladies doing it, but it's going to be raining up until Friday. So, at least it's supposed to. I see his hand. What do you got? Um, what do you got? Pray, pray for my cousin. She's health and mercy. Um, I know she probably is a zero, and she prays for her, and she's been saved. But she, she, oh, pray for Michael. Oh, okay. You know, another thing is, too, we've been teaching uh, Lucian Bible. Amen. And he's been sitting there, and uh, <laughs> we've been, uh, he's been in our Bible studies with us. So he's learning, learning some things, amen. I was really kind of surprised because he said he was saying some things today, and I'm going, oh, that's in the Bible. <laughs> you know, he was actually, he's actually picking it up, man. But it's a blessing. And so, by the way, that would be a good example for us adults to pick up what God has said in his word, amen. And to obey it and follow it. So, 
Amen. All righty, well, let's go to prayer. We'll pray now. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight, Lord. We want to thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be at your throne, God, that you're in the throne room of God. Through the Jesus Christ, we come, Lord, not through a veil that was made by men's hands, but a veil that is made by the hand of the Lord. Lord, you made the plan. You carried it out. It is executed. And your son was had died for us and was buried and rose again three days later. He is now the veil between God and man. He's a mediator between God and man. He is who we go through to get to our Father in heaven. God, we want to thank you, praise you, and give you the glory. We thank you for the Word of God, the King James Bible for the English-speaking people. Lord, we thank you for that. It's the true, inerrant Word of God. All these other versions, Lord, even the people that, that read those will say it's not the complete Word of God. Well, why do they want that? If they can have the complete, in, inerrant Word of God, the thing that is finished, and that's the King James Bible. I don't understand, God, but you know. And God, we trust you, and I trust you, a hundred percent, and I've never trusted a man 100 percent ever. God, I pray that you help us. I pray you help us, each and every one of us, Lord, to be grateful for what you've done. And Lord, in our hearts that we'll have a trust for you, Lord, that will blossom our faith, and God, that our faith would grow. God, I pray that you'll uh, we'll be grateful for the Holy Ghost that dwells within us and never grieve or quench the Spirit of God. And every day, Lord, we seem to have a problem with some things that see, sometimes just sideswipe us, and Lord, and sometimes we don't even recognize that it does. And it influences us to, to think wrong or do wrong. God, we lay our sin before you even now. God, because we want to have straight communication with you and not anything interfering, no barrier between our God and us. God, we ask that the blood of Christ be applied even now, Lord, to wash us, Lord, so that our, uh, we'll be uh, like new, we'll be fresh. And Lord, that, uh, that as you say in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, we're fa you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And God, to be renewed is a blessing. I pray, to pray now for these requests that we mentioned, Lord, and many of them. God, I pray for Miss Doris, and she asks, thanks you for her love and mercy that you've given her, salvation, and she prays for her brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for giving us a renewed spirit in this place, and God, taking out the, the evil that has come, had come into our place here. Lord, I know you've gotten rid of some of it. And Lord, I just pray that your power come to this place and the Holy Ghost have his way. God, I pray that you give us, I know you. there is some power because we have the word of God. We have people that have come in the name of Jesus Christ to worship together. But Lord, may you have that outpouring of the spirit on this place. And God, I pray that we don't let any wickedness in and bind Satan in the hordes of hell. And uh, Lord, push them back. And Lord, let us have the free reign to have liberty and, and uh, righteousness reign in this place. God, we pray for Dan and Rochelle. They ask for the Kalpana's family and the Van Kish and the Ky and Ky Ky Kyra's and their salvation. The families here, Lord. I pray you'll bless them, Lord. Pray you'll work in their hearts. I pray that the Dan and Rochelle can be a testimony unto them. Pray for Ms. Rochelle and all the ladies that are pregnant that we pray for safe pregnancies. Lord, I pray that these babies will be born healthy and, uh, and get saved early in life, Lord. God, and when they come to that age of accountability, you know exactly what they need. We just put it out there, Lord, that they, we want them saved. We like to see them uh, raised in the fear and admonition of the Lord. They have that fear of God. You tell us to raise them in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Why would we not t teach them to fear God then? That's what we're trying to do, fear God. He is righteous and just, and, and, and he's mighty and powerful and an awesome God, and he's a consuming fire. That's what your word says. So I believe you. God, you could consume a man in a matter of a split second. In fact, a second, it wouldn't even be a second. But Lord, why should we not fear you? But people don't want to fear you anymore. Help us, Lord, to be a God-fearing people. God, I pray for the church kids, salvation. I pray those that need to get saved to come to Jesus. And the missionary, Brother Velheis, in uh, Yuma, Lord. Give him wisdom, knowledge, understanding. Keep them healthy. May souls be saved in their ministry. Reaching those Indians there, American Indians, for a cause of Christ. 
Lord, I pray that you'll help Dan and Rochelle love you even more. Their love for you will grow. They have wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And many blessings from you, Lord, come to them and that they may rejoice. Mm -hmm. James, the Lord, the third, we pray for him and his brother and sisters. They, they'll come here. Pray for he wants his dog to be a real good dog, Lord, and help him and show him how to uh, teach that dog so that dog will do right. God, I pray for him to gain wisdom, Lord, and knowledge and understanding, mm -hmm. for David to learn to walk. And God, uh, I think it's not too long before he's going to. He's already trying to stand up on his own. God, I pray that you'll just work on this with him. God, I pray that you'll help uh, Faith and uh, the Fazio family, Lord. They need to get saved. And for Mrs. Porter and her health and her hip, and Lord, I pray uh, when she comes here, Lord, it would be a blessing for her to come. And just uh, She's our honorary church member. Mm -hmm. God, for Mrs. Tenney, take away the cancer. Mrs. Hernandez, the cancer in her legs. God, I pray you just bless them. And for Juana and Rochelle and Ashley and Leah and their pregnancies. And Lord, we pray for uh, uh, Jake and Diamond to be adopted into our family. Leroy Sr. and Jr., spiritual and protection, Lord, for you know where they're at. And they really need it, Lord. We pray for the Western Roundup Youth Rally. Brother, Brother uh, Cliff Taylor is going to be preaching. Give him power from on high. And I pray many souls will come and souls will be saved. And Lord, we just have a great time. And and we have uh, fellowship and singing and preaching and worship. God, that you'll get the glory from it all. The Akron family, keep them safe in their ministry, Lord. Bless them in a mighty way. We pray for Mrs. Grissom, her dad, and Jody to get saved and their health issues. Use their health issues to get them saved. I mean, use it, Lord, to, to get them to think about life and death issues. Pray for her mom and her health and for her, her stepdad, Robert, to get saved. For her brother and sister and nieces to come to Jesus Christ also. And that Mrs. Grissom has an unspoken request, personal, and one for work. Lord, you know what the issues are, and she'd like the will of God be done in those things. And God, that you be shown mighty in her life and can have her a closer walk with God. We just don't even know, Lord, some people, as they walk with you, Lord, uh, the graciousness that you show them. And God, for the struggles that they deal with and the great rewards that they'll receive for enduring hardness. God, I pray for uh, uh, Miss Lori to have wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. If you'd like to have a travel trailer also, Lord, you would make that possible for her. God, I pray you give her just the one you want her to have. Brother Art says he prays for m uh, me and my family. And Lord, I pray that you help us in uh, Jacob and Diamond's adoption. And Edwin, Lord, needs to get saved. Yeah. Lord, he's having, starting to have a lot of health issues and stuff, Lord. I pray you help him. God, he's starting to get up in years. He needs, to, he needs your, your help, Lord. He needs salvation. I pray for Brother Art, his health, Lord. We've been praying for him. I pray that you continue. I'm glad he's here tonight. Amen. What a blessing, Lord. Amen. God, I pray you just give him some strength. Give him strength, Lord. Give him strength in his legs, strength in his body all around, Lord. I just pray that you help him. Pray for Miss Liz. Her bio family needs to get saved. And the Lord, and pray for Liz, and she help her to keep focused on you and follow the will of the Lord in her life. And pray, she prays for Miss Lori and asks that you continue to help her and bless her. And Robert asks for him to have a hatred for sin, but love wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And we do pray for our government, our, our president and our vice president. They have strength to stand and have wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And put down the evil ones that are trying to destroy him and, and our vice president. Lord, you put, them up, you put up governments, you put up people, you put them down. Lord, you set up cities and you take cities down. You take you take old nations, you set them up and you put them down. I think that's why when America got started, you you made this nation. And God, you used men and women who were God fearing people to start this nation. Were they always right? No, but you did use them to start this nation. And God, we're here now and established. And if we if we weren't here and established, it wasn't your will. And God, you started many nations around this world. And God, they're still here. That's why Israel's still here. Because you started it. No one can abolish what you started unless you want it to be taken down. God, I just pray that you just help us, Lord, and, and get evil out of our nation. I like to get evil totally out of our nation, push it back. But, Lord, we've allowed it into the core of our nation, right into the heart of our nation. And now they're running for office. <laughs> Wickedness and evil in high places. And like one lady said that she from Cuba, she said, she said that uh, Bernie Sanders was a pure evil. 
And, and on the outside, you would say he wasn't, but he is. Lord, we just pray for Western Roundup Youth Rally. Lord, pray for the workers. and I pray for Brother uh, Robert's work and co-workers that they'll walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh. They get saved. James and Chow ask for health issues and finances. Media ministry, Lord. Answer the requests there, Lord. God, for Chow and her health, especially, Lord, she wasn't feeling well the other day. Pray for her, pray for her family and her mom, their health, and they get saved, Lord, out of uh, uh, the Buddhist background. God, I pray for God's grace and mercy upon them. And James' uh, driving test tomorrow, and Lord, I pray you'll bless in a mighty way there, and that God, your will in James' work will be uh, a blessing upon them. Yeah. We pray for unspoken requests, Lord, for Samuel and uh, and David, Lord, uh, their salvation. We pray for James III, his spiritual growth and wisdom and knowledge and understanding for him. And God, uh, Karen asked for her bio family to get saved. And Lord, please may you make that possible. Uh, Lord, work on their hearts even now before anyone ever gets to talk to them. And Karen wants to love you with all her heart, soul, mind, and strength. Be obedient to you, Lord. And God, uh, she wants to have wisdom and knowledge and understanding also. And she's got five unspoken requests. And she also prays, Lord, for uh, 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 she prays for uh, her sister to get to meet Leah. And Lord, we just pray that you bless in a mighty way, and that Leah will get saved. And Lord, she wants uh, our neighbors to get saved, accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. She prays for Ben and Grace. Lord, help them. Their health. They're getting up in years. They're way up there in years now. And we pray for. Uh, she prays for uh, Janet and, and Brother Charlie. Lord, the health issues there, the cancer, Brother Charlie, uh, he would love to, to see his wife healed. Mm -hmm. God, what rejoicing would come. But he, I know, Brother Charlie, he'll still rejoice in you, Lord. God, we just want to thank you for him. I pray for Esther, Lord, and her bio family to get saved, to die, Donald get uh, saved in his health issues and help him, Lord. And Karen, uh, Esther wants to walk closer with you, Lord. And she just wants to tell you she loves you. Lord, uh, that's what we all should be saying. We love you, Lord. Mm -hmm. God, we just want to give you the praise and honor and glory for what you've done in our life. Thank you for saving our soul. Right. Boy, would we be in a mess if we weren't saved. God, uh, we should just be thankful that we're been, uh, things have been untangled in our life. Mm -hmm. God, you put us on the straight and narrow way. God, we want to praise you and give you glory and honor. In Jesus Christ's precious name, amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to take an offering. And then we'll have music. Yes, sir. Where's, oh, there's the music guy. It's the music man. Amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. Please bless this time of giving in Jesus' name. Deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he would give his only Son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away As wounds which mar the Chosen One Bring many sons to glory Behold the man upon a cross My sin upon his shoulders Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. 
His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart, His wounds have paid my ransom. in your life you and I may never know all the reasons why you feel you've been forsaken if someone only knew if someone only understood just what you're going through God knows God cares he holds the answers to all your prayers. God knows, God cares. Gave his only son to die on the cross so you and I would know that God knows. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. It seemed so much to give, to give it all for one. So no matter where you're going, he's walked that road for you. So you would know that someone knows just what you're going through. God knows, God cares, He holds the answers to all your prayers. God knows, God cares, gave His only Son to die on the cross so you and I would know. God knows, God cares, He holds the answers to all your prayers. God knows, God cares, give His only Son to die on the cross so you and I would know. Give His only Son to die on the cross so you and I would know that God knows. Amen. Well, let's dismiss uh, Ronnie's class. And when they, they're dismissing, we'll turn to Proverbs chapter 11. That's Proverbs chapter 11. That's Proverbs chapter 11. For all you who didn't hear me the first time, when you find it, let's stand. Proverbs chapter 11, start in verse 1. It said, The false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. When pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. The integrity of the upright shall guide them, but the perversions of the transgressors shall destroy them. Riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. The righteousness of the perfect shall direct his way, but the wicked shall fall by his own wickedness. The righteousness of the upright shall deliver them, but transgressors shall be taken in their own naughtiness. 
When a wicked man dieth, his expectation shall perish, and the hope of unjust men perisheth. The righteous is delivered out of trouble, and the wicked cometh in his stead. And the hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth his neighbor, but through knowledge shall the just be delivered. When it goeth well with the righteous, the city rejoices, and when the wicked perish, there is shouting. By the blessing of the upright, the city exalted, is exalted, but it is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. Our Heavenly Father, help us to understand what we read and what we're going to read and what we're going to look at. And Lord, you just take us as far as we need to go, because this is your time. Lord, we need you to speak through me. I can't do this on my own. God, I pray that the message from uh, the throne room of God will make it here to the ears of the people that need to hear. We give you praise for it in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. You can be seated. You know what I'm thinking of doing? I was, uh, I was practicing yesterday, and my kids, uh, they were in the car, and they said, Tell us a story, Dad. So I did the three pigs. And then, uh, then I did uh, a woman in a shoe. Jack and the Beanstalk. I told a bunch of stories. But I did it from a point of view of them going after the things of this world instead of going after the things of God. <laughs> and I said, we had, the, we had the three pigs, and we had one the straw pig, the wood pig, and the brick pig. Uh, you know, and then the big bad wolf, Joel, Joel the big bad wolf, Olstein, couldn't blow down the, the brick house because it was solid. It was, a, it was concrete, so to say. It was... It was a solid foundation. But he could blow down the things that are just, you know, simple like a straw house and a wood house. Huh? And, uh, but they found comfort in the brick house. <laughs> and I was, I was preaching this to the kids, man, and I was going on about it. And, uh, and then uh, on the Jack and the Beanstalk, he went to go find the, go the goose that find, uh, laid the golden egg. I said, he would have shut it down as finding the Bible that had the, the treasure. <laughs> Uh, he went out and he sold his cow for a bill of goods, amen? Five, five magic beans. No, no, this is all just coming to me while I'm, while I'm while driving along. And they tell us a story, Dad. So I just started. It was all by, it was all, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, when you don't, when it just off, off the cuff. That's basically what it is. Huh? Impromptu. And so I was just doing that. And, man, and I was even kind of surprised the stories ended all right. <laughs> and I started thinking, I said, I had to do this like on a video or something, tell stories like that to people. I mean, take those fairy tales and turn them into real, realistic uh, principles, amen? And, uh, and not end like the fairy tales do, end like it should, biblically, amen? <laughs> amen. And uh, I mean, seriously. And, but then and that's what made me think of Proverbs here. I was, I was reading this, and I've read Proverbs, I don't know how many times. It's in the hundreds of times. And um, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 1, came to my mind while I was reading this and studying it. That, that verse there tells us, tells us here, a false balance is an abomination of the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. That's what all Proverbs 11 is about. Verse 1. I was wondering why he put that as number one verse. And as you read, you'll see the unjust balance and the just balance. And the, all the way through chapter 11. And I was sitting there going, all the times I read it, I never, never saw that. Want to know why? Because there's always something new to learn. God can only give you so much. And you can only take in so much. And then he just says, here, let me show you something else. <laughs> and I've quoted that verse. And I bet you I've quoted that verse at least 100 times. And I've got railed on by other preachers for quoting that verse, and they say that's not what it means. Oh, yes, it does mean that. And God explains it in this chapter, in, verse, in chapter 11, and he'll go over it with the unjust man and the just man, the righteous man and the, the wicked man, and, and on and on. And he talk, he talk about, well, you know, here's, why you, here's how you get balanced, and here's how you aren't balanced. Huh? And he goes on and tells you, and by the way, and all of it, ha all of it deals with spiritual God's not so interested in your physical as he is the spiritual. Oh, yeah, he'll take care of you physically. He'll supply your needs. He'll give you a roof over your head. He'll put clothes on your back, food in your belly. But that's not his main purpose for you. You're to please him. Now, let me ask you a question. How are you going to worship God? In, in flesh? No, spirit and truth, the Bible says. The only way you can worship God. So God's interested in 
your spiritual being. So every, I believe every bit of the Word of God doesn't just have a physical application, but also has a spiritual application, which is high on God's list of what He wants you to grasp from His Word. Not that you can't use it for physical applications to help avoid things physically. Uh, but see, you need to be spiritual. See, if you just do things physically, which these preachers told me, so it's just only a physical application, now you're out of balance, I told them when they said that, and they got angry at me. Because now I just told them they were violating this verse. <laughs> I said you need to be balanced, not only physical, but spiritual. You walk physically in this life, but you've got to be a spiritual being. That's what pleases God. God's not, God's not pleased with you if you walk in the flesh. Why? Because the flesh fails you and will fail Christ. He didn't come to save your flesh. He came to save your soul. Huh? And he speaks in your spirit and soul, and he will talk to you that way. It's not all about the flesh. But man, men today, are it's all about the flesh. Look at these churches now are all about the flesh. That's what this music's about. That's what this teach. I can't believe they don't even know what the Bible says in these churches. Hmm? I told I told my I told my kids I said you know what these people they're teaching all this about the uh, supposedly supposed to be a church and they're teaching all about the flesh and to f fulfill the lust of the flesh instead of fulfilling, fulfilling God and uh, worshiping Him in truth and spirit and instead they want to fulfill the lust of the flesh and they think that's okay and it's pleasing unto God that's exactly what they're teaching huh and I said and then we preach the truth and they got big buildings and lots of people and we got a little tiny group. You know what that tells me? God talks about that in this passage of scripture. If I get to it, I'll show you. Hmm? He talks about it. He talks about these people not teaching right and yet they got large crowds. He talks about people who are doing right and no one's following them basically. Huh? That encourages me. Huh? Cuz look at that, and my wife can tell you and my kids can tell you. I'll tell you the truth. Uh, when I when I teach Bible to my kids and we're sitting at the breakfast table and the dinner table and I'm teaching Bible to them, guess what? I'm telling them the truth. Wonder why? Because I want them to go to the way of truth. Because my ways stink. Did you hear that? My ways stink. See, I don't want them to follow my ways. I want them to follow the Lord's ways. See, the Bible tells us not to follow, to do things according to our understanding, uh, not not our knowledge, not our wisdom. But he wants you to follow his wisdom, his knowledge, his understanding. See, that's what he wants us to have. So guess what? I'm trying to get to them, to them inherit this. See, I don't want them to inherit the way I used to re believe and the way I was raised. Uh, I want them to be. I want them to inherit the word of God into their hearts and mind. So we say here. So he's got a false balance of abomination of the Lord. A just wait is his delight. Amen. And that's what he's looking for. A just wait. And then it says, when pride cometh, then cometh shame. That's an out-of-balance situation. Because pride is always filled with destruction. Look at, and look at, I have, this is maybe what you would call a pet peeve, and a lot of people think that's what this is called, but it isn't. It's biblical. And that is, there's no good pride. People say, I'm, pr I'm, pr I'm proud of my son. Sorry, ain't wrong answer. Well, I'm proud of the way I did things. Ain't wrong answer. I'm proud of my business. Ain't wrong answer. You're supposed to be pleased. This is my son and who I am well pleased. That's what Jesus, God said about Jesus Christ. Huh? He's always talking about pleasing him, not making him proud. It's not a pet peeve. It's actually biblical. And I've heard preachers stand in our pulpit here. I love them. And, and I know they're good preachers and they don't mean anything by it. But they'll say, I'm proud of this and I'm proud of that. And I said, quit talking about pride. Because only by pride cometh contention. Huh? Yeah, pr pride cometh destruction. Haughty spirit before a fall. But I'm, I'm not trying to teach people pride. I want to teach them humility. Because pride bringeth shame. That's what it says. It's, you want to know why shame comes? Because you're out of balance. See, humility puts you in balance. Get in balance. See, I'm so glad 
that there are certain people that used to be in our church, and, I, and, I, and I'm, I don't want to sound wrong about this, but they were so arrogant and prideful, you couldn't correct them from it. That they, they would wear shirts that would say, I am proud. <laughs> huh? And I'm sitting there going, and I'm saying, look at I'm trying to stop being proud, prideful. And you're, here you are propagating it. And, who, and little ones are learning to be prideful, and you, your family's prideful, and blah, blah, blah. And I don't want that. I want people to learn humility in Christ because that's where balance is at. And you will please God. See, you don't want to be, look, at it says an abomination to the Lord. That's a false balance, abomination. Now, let me, can you get any worse than that? Abomination is about as bad as you can get in the eyes of God. Huh? You're asking God to eat out of the dump. Huh? Grab some stuff we dumped in the garbage and let it go ahead and put it on your plate. Hmm? Here, have some of this, God. You know, there's things he rejected in the Old Testament when they brought something to him for sacrifice, and he rejected it. Or in worship. Because it was ungodly. Because it was done wrong. It was out of balance. And he rejected it. He killed people. You say, well, he's not that way today. Oh, yeah, he changed because he's, he's not the same yesterday, today, and forever. The only thing that stops God from taking everybody's life in this world is probably Christ. And I'm not saying probably it is Christ because of his son. He's, he's, the, he's the mediator between God and man. And I can see Christ standing up there. Okay, God, <laughs> I know this is, this is horrible to you. It's an abomination. Can we, can we, like he said in the New Testament, you know what Christ said? He said, don't cut the tree down. Let's put some dung around it, dig around it and dung it, and see if it brings forth fruit next year. Hold off another year. I believe that's him pleading for us. Hold off, God, one more time. We know they're not doing what's right. We know that that's an abomination unto you. But Lord, one more time. You know what God does? He looks at his son and says, I'll do it for you. I'll do it for you. Hmm? But here he says right here, but with the lowly is wisdom. And, and who's the lowly? Those that the Bible says, uh, learn, uh, I am meek and lowly, learn of me. That's what Christ says. And so someone is in Christ, someone who's following the Lord. That's the only way you're going to be lowly. You can't be lowly on yourself. Your flesh is stinketh. It's full of pride. My flesh is full of pride. Look, at I'm not just pointing on you. I'm pointing at me. I know what I am. Huh? But I'm just trying to help you to understand who you are. By the way, I preached this in a church in the Seattle area. And boy, did I get railed on. <laughs> How dare you tell us that we're prideful. And our flesh is wicked. The Bible tells us there's no good thing in your flesh. <laughs> so I believe God. <laughs> My flesh has no good, nothing good to offer me. If I walk in the flesh, I'm getting offered a bad, a bad uh, deal. Uh, and I'm going to offer God a bad deal. Do you understand that? It gives you a right, that you, it gives you a, a, a goal or a, a reason to walk in the spirit instead of the flesh. I don't want to offer this to God. Huh? My, my flesh stinketh. The Bible says that sin dwells in your flesh. Dwells. What's that mean? Lives there. Hmm? I see some of you guys shaking your head yes because you know it. <laughs> huh? Amen. It's not, a, it's not a surprise. Ding, oh wow, I didn't know I sinned. But there's people who believe they don't sin. I had one lady tell me, I'm not a sinner, I go to church. Go down to the prison where all the murderers are at, they're the sinners. Really? Only ones that sin on the face of the earth, the murderers, huh? Amen. Verse 3, the integrity of the upright shall guide them. See that? The integrity of the upright shall guide them. That's, you want to know why it guides them in? The Word of God. You want to know why they have integrity? Because of the Word of God. You know what integrity is? Someone give me a definition they believe integrity is. Yes. That's a good definition. Yeah. It's, it's who and what you are. You will, you will do right if no one's looking. Or if someone is looking. You don't do it right because they're looking. You do it even when they're not looking. David had his integrity. There were times he messed up, just like most people do. But look, at your integrity will preserve you. It will guide you. So you'll say, oh, no, thus saith the Lord. You know when it was just uh, Joseph and Potiphar's wife? 
He could have went and uh, did wrong with Potiphar's wife. But you know what integrity said? Oh, no, you'll offend God. You'll offend God if you go ahead and commit this heinous crime against him. Uh, commit uh, fornication with him. Adultery. And so he said that he ran. No, my integrity tells me, put on some wheels. I'm heading out of here. <laughs> I'm gone. And he didn't go back to get his jacket or his coat when he left because she grabbed his coat and it came off. And he didn't go back, well, I better go save my coat. No, his integrity says, forget the coat. Hmm. Who cares? She can keep the coat. <laughs> huh? I'm not worried about it. I'm worried about my safety and God. I don't want, I don't want to fall to, to sin and I don't want God to be offended. And I don't want to offend God. I want to hurt him. Integrity does that in private. All by yourself. By the way, hard thing to do for people nowadays because they got their phones, they got their iPads, they got their laptops, they got their PC computers, they got all kinds of electronic equipment, and they can get in the darkness all by themselves. They, when we, my wife and I took a class on, on kids owning cell phones. This has been a few years now, right? About eight years? Back then. 40% of all those kids that had cell phones put, posted themselves on the Internet naked. 40%. Kids. We're talking 18 and under. 40%. Want to know why? Because they have no integrity. They're in the dark all by themselves. Think no one's looking. Google saw it. The person who they sent it to saw it. And by the way, once it goes across the net, <laughs> it's out there forever. 30 years from now, it can come up again. You say, how do you know? It come up when people would pose without clothes on. I mean, these famous actors and actresses now, and they were struggling, so they went and posed without clothes on to make some money, and now it's coming up 20, 30 years later. Look at what they did then. You think the Internet's going to be any simpler or harder? Huh? Yeah, they'll be, they'll be posting that stuff. <laughs> They're looking hard at Trump trying to find things. I'm telling you, they're going to have enemies that are going to bring it up. You better have integrity. That's where you're going to be balanced. But the perverseness of transgressors shall, what? Destroy them. Yeah. Perverseness of transgressors, no integrity. It'll destroy you. You're either going to be preserved or destroyed. Can you imagine if you... Uh, my mom used to can, I mentioned this earlier, she used to can all kinds of things. She canned pickles and beets and corn. and I mean, you just named green beans, you named it, she canned it. She, named, she canned the whole nine yards. She even canned meat. Okay? And she canned all this stuff. If she didn't know how to can and she did it wrong, then it was going to destroy somebody. It'd kill them. It's called botulism. And even when she did it right, you always check, because they have what they call it, a tab on it. You always check to see if that tab pushes in and out. If it does, that thing is uh, contaminated. You throw it out instead of eating it. You do that with cans today. In fact, I was cleaning our pantry out. And I was cleaning it out and straightening it up. We have to do that every once in a while. But I was doing that. And I straightened it up. And I found cans that, were, that, that, that you put, can push down on. Well, there's air in there. The air's not supposed to be in there. It's supposed to be airtight. So you don't even open them up. You don't even think about cooking them. You throw them out, and it's not worth it. The can costs 50 cents. not worth somebody's life. It's destructive. That's what perverseness does in a man's life. It's destructive. Integrity is going to preserve you. It's going to keep from contamination in your life. But see, this perverseness allows contamination in. And eventually it destroy you. You said it won't destroy a Christian because I'm saved. Really? I didn't know you were exempt from sin. You know, exempt from destruction. If a bomb fell through the ceiling, you say, well, I'm a Christian. It won't hurt me. <laughs> huh? I'm sorry. If a bomb came through that ceiling, we're all probably history. Unless something's protecting us. I mean, if, unless your name's Adolf Hitler and they put a bomb right next to you and it's a table leg that saved your life. <laughs> you guys probably don't know the history. Do you know the history on that? A lot of people died for that. They executed people for it. 
because they had a big plan. They were trying to get rid of him, trying to get rid of Adolf Hitler. It was a, they set the bag down that had the bomb in it, and the table leg protected him. Uh, everybody else died, but he lived. Isn't that funny how that works? But they were trying to destroy him. And the only thing that's going to save you is Christ from destruction. See, better if if you find out that you don't have integrity, start start building integrity in your life. And it's going to take you to make decisions, and God's not going to make the decision for you. He's going to tell you what decision you should make, and then He's going to ask you to be balanced. And that means you better choose right every time. That's where balance is at. When you're out of balance is when you choose wrong. Boy, have we chosen wrong too many times. Why? Because it looks like fun. You know, the coronavirus, they got, and I, t- I mentioned that they're not going to be any, they said for, the, for these tournaments that they're having right now, they're going to have no fans. They're closing off the gyms to any fans. The only one can be there is media and the players and the coaches and stuff. That's it. And so that's all they're going to have. Huh? You, you want to know why? Because, see, they're trying to write things. That's might be what you have to do in your life sometimes. Just close everybody out. And I'm not talking about quit coming to church or being around godly people, but there's people that are, that are a disease to you that will make you get negative and crazy and and out of balance and you have to say i have to be done with you right now <laughs> right now i mean you you lead me astray or you 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 burn my brain out huh? and so you got to build some integrity you got to say hey i'm done right now with you i gotta i gotta i gotta get some strength here i gotta make some right decisions in my life and i've had many a guy say that i gotta make some right decisions huh and they said, I've been making wrong decisions all my life. But they're telling me, I have no integrity. <laughs> By the way, they don't teach integrity in homes anymore. Your little one coming up, you're going to have to teach it some integrity. This is right, just do right. Huh? You know how I taught my son, oldest son, James, to not drink? I took pages out of magazines with pictures of alcohol on it, and I go bad, 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 and I throw it on the ground and stomp it, then I pick it up and I tear it all up and throw it in the garbage. And I said, now you do it. I mean, he's like about five, six years old. And I give him a picture. I said, here. And he goes, alcohol's bad, bad, bad. Stomp it, tear it up, and throw it in the garbage. I said, let's do it again. You may, you may go through a whole bunch of magazines. Amen. Same with cigarettes. You don't need to smoke. It's bad. It's, it, it, look, integrity says, I'll stay away from that. That stuff will destroy you. You may, not, you may not go to hell because of it, but you'll smell like you've been there and also destroy your body. You know, I was telling my kids, alcohol is a poison. There's only a poison that we sell for people to consume, and it's legal. Huh? I said, it's just as dangerous as any other drug, because that's what it is. And I said, but they say it's okay, because, you know, it's legal. Legal according to who? According to man, because the ways of man, then, are over the ways of death. And that's where it goes. And how many people get killed every year from alcohol? You want to know what? Their choices are out of balance. And you, and you know what the scripture is saying, I've taught them, is that you, you'll pervert the law if you're, you drink. You're going to pervert the law. You want to know why our judges should never drink? For that reason alone. But we've got a bunch of drunk judges behind the bench. We've got a bunch of junk, drunk politicians making laws. <laughs> Man, I had something on Bernie Sanders back when... Uh, Iran took uh, over 400 hostages, of American hostages. You know Bernie Sanders was on Iran's side? Most people don't even know that. Bernie Sanders was for Iran, the Ayatollah, for taking the, he, he was for, on his side for taking 400 of our hostages. And he's probably all good for him killing them. Hmm? No, I, I got this report. It was sent to me. I was like, really? I didn't know. Now, I grew up, and I was, I was married to Rhonda at the time that this happened. And when, uh, when uh, Reagan became president, he put an end to it right then. As soon as he became president, he ended that, that hostage situation. Jimmy Carter let it go on for 300 and some days. He wouldn't go collect our people. He wouldn't send troops in there and destroy them. Want to know why? No integrity. But, but uh, old Reagan gets into office and he says, no, nah, let's get them back. Guess what they did? The Ayatollah did. He released the hostages because he believed Reagan. <laughs> huh? Guess what? When you got integrity, 
people believe you. They can say, well, he never lies. Or he always is there. He's faithful. Hmm? I wonder if people can say that about you. Well, I don't care what people say about me. You ought to care somewhat about what they think about you, especially when it comes to integrity and truth. You can always trust him. He tells the truth. Can they say that about you? Now look what it says. Riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivereth from death. Huh? Riches profit not in the day of death. Oh, yeah, how much is that going to help you? Well, I got $55,000. Can I buy life? Life insurance, maybe. But you're going to still die. By the way, why do they call it life insurance? Or they should call it death insurance. Huh? But it isn't going to buy you life. You can't give God enough money to keep you alive. He's taking you in the day appointed. Amen? But here it says, but righteousness delivers from death. There is how you pay God. And how do you, how do you become a righteous person? Because there's none righteous, no, not one. You know, righteousness is in Christ. That means you're going to have to be saved again. Born again. That doesn't mean you have to get saved again. That just means you have to be a saved person. You have to be someone who's trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. And walk righteously. You can't just be saved. Because there's a lot of people who get saved, and that's all the farther they want to go in Christ. But how about walking righteously? Showing people how it's done. So to deliver you from death. And it doesn't just mean you're going to have a long life. That just means that there's a time that you could have got killed, but because you were walking righteously and you made the right choice, you didn't end up over here where death was at. You ended up over here where life was at. You avoided being killed. There was a guy waiting for you, but you didn't go that way. Huh? Saved your life. Righteousness saved your life. And look, there's many times I wasn't walking righteously when I was lost. And I'm telling you, I thought I was going to be killed a few times. Man, I remember a guy running me off into a ditch in my car. Not just a guy. There was like five guys in the vehicle. And uh, I was with Fred. Remember Ronda Fred? And, and uh, where we get run off. And, and so I got out of my car. The first thing I thought of was, well, there's five against two. We're probably taking a whooping here. Maybe whooping unto death. And I went and opened up the trunk of the car. I pulled a, I pulled a crowbar out. The hugest crowbar you ever seen. thing had to be four foot long. And I just started wielding it. I started beating his truck with it. I didn't let him get out of it. I just started beating it. You know what? That guy got a little afraid. But, you know, he could have bowled out a gun and shot me dead. I wasn't thinking about that. See, that's what stupidity does for you. Unrighteousness, I was on the wrong pathway. That guy could have had a gun, killed me right then. He could have jumped out with a bigger crowbar <laughs> and beat me down with it. How dare I beat on his truck? <laughs> But I thought he thought I was crazy enough. And I'm not, that's not a bragging story. That is like how stupid you can be. Following unrighteousness. Walking the wrong way. Look at what it says in the next verse. The righteousness of the perfect shall direct his way. See that? The righteousness of the perfect shall direct his way. And how do you get direction? Through the word of God. How are you going to get righteous? The word of God, after you've got Christ, you've got to follow the word. You've got to read it. You've got to read it so you know what to follow. Can you imagine that? So uh, someone gives you instructions. Says, Here, here's the instruction booklet to this job. I want you to do this job. Read the instruction booklet. And you never read it. You're going to know how to do the job? James, he, he was asked to run this equipment for finding IEDs and on the roadside, you know, roadside bombs and stuff to protect their soldiers. And so he would go with his machine and he'd find the bombs and he'd tell them what it was made out of, how it was laying, how deep it was, how big the bomb was with this piece of equipment. So they asked him, how did you find out how to use this thing and get so exact with it? He goes, I read the instructions. <laughs> That's what he told them. You know what they said? We need you to teach others how to do that. No one reads the instructions. What they were doing was they were going along finding the bombs, and they didn't know how to use the machine, and then they diagnose it wrong. And people were getting hurt. So he said, he said, I don't know how to use this machine. Why do you want me to use it? And he says, well, here you go. Learn how to use it. So he started reading the instruction manual. You know what God says? There's an instruction manual. You want to know how to walk righteously? Don't just pretend like you walk righteously or figure it out your own self from your own flesh, your own ways, on your own understanding. Get the understanding, knowledge, and wisdom of God and walk how to learn how to walk righteously so that you can be that kind of person. That you'll be balanced. 
Eee, amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I kick my heels up. Amen. Praise the Lord. But the wicked shall fall by his own wickedness. There it is. His trap is wickedness. Our safety is righteousness. How do you know? Because look at the next verse. The righteousness of the upright shall deliver them. Huh? He was just talking about his walking righteously. Huh? Righteousness of the perfect shall direct his way. There you are. You got, you got good direction. And now what's it going to do? Deliver you. Again. Man, he keeps call, talking about delivering you. You know what? A, a just balance is going to deliver you. Every single time. What has he got right here? But transgressors shall be taken in their own naughtiness. There it is. Their own ways again. Destroy them. You don't want your own ways. You need to read Proverbs 3, uh, 5 and 6. Amen. Man, and that'll tell you, you don't want your own ways. Don't trust your own understanding. It'll lead you astray. There's so many people have their own understanding, and then they become very bitter in their heart because it's contrary to truth, and it's contrary to what someone's teaching, like I'm teaching, and they'll get mad at me because they don't believe it that way. Not because the Bible is, is say, agreeing with them. It's because they don't believe it. And that's what they usually tell me. I don't believe that. Well, it's Bible. I don't believe it. So you don't believe God? what his word says. Look at it. It's not my word. It's God's word. Did he not just say that? The righteousness of the upright shall deliver them? Yes, he did. Huh? But transgressors shall be taken in their own naughtiness. Naughtiness is a bad thing, too, by the way. It's not just have, have pointing your finger at a little kid saying, naughty, naughty, naughty. That's not what it is. But that's what we made it. We, dif we diffused that, that sin. It's like calling someone an alcoholic instead of a drunkard. I really have a problem with calling someone an alcoholic. I, I don't have a problem with calling him a drunkard because that's what God calls him. A drunkard means it's, it's a, a distasteful word. Uh, adultery is a distasteful word. What they call is extramarital relationship now. <laughs> I'm sorry. There's no such thing as extramarital relationship. It's called adultery. Look at it. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll take one of those extramaritals and one of those premaritals and one of those postmaritals. Yeah. <laughs> it's called adultery. It's called fornication when you're not married to the person uh, uh, and you're not married. Hmm. It's wicked. God wants it with sin to be painted wicked. He wants you to hate it, be distasteful. And often we don't do that. We don't get in the word of God and let it direct our ways. Amen. When a wicked man dieth, his expectation shall perish. And that's really, truly the truth. Amen. He dies, and so does his expectations. And the hope of the unjust men perishes. Uh, they hope, and they By the way, all this we've seen in politics now, one day it's all going to perish. No, you can trust God on it. By the way, don't... I've told my kids about expectations. I said, a lady's going to get married, and she sees her husband, and he's the, the knight in shining armor. Riding a white charger, coming in, swooping her up, you know, the Prince's Bride thing. Take her, taking her away and, and hugging and kissing on her and all this stuff. And they live happily ever after the end. It doesn't work that way. Never. Never has it worked one time for anybody that way. But your expectations is that. Because, see, the guy, we're so, we love so, each other so much. 20 years down the road, he's busy about business. And he's, and he's frustrated about something. Or his business is not as good as it used to be. Or whatever it is. He's not making as much money as he's hoping to make. You know, to support his family. And then he comes home and he's not as happy as he used to be. <laughs> huh? But it doesn't mean he doesn't love you. It's just that the, the, the cares of the world are getting to him. The things that he needs to take care of in his life that he feels responsible for. He doesn't feel like he's doing a good enough job. Hmm? Things that he's failing. And so he doesn't feel right about it, doesn't, and, he, and he struggles with it, and sometimes he takes it out on the people he cares about. Doesn't mean he doesn't love By the way, and then you'll say, this isn't what I wanted, this isn't what I expected, I'll divorce you now. But you just divorce the guy that still loves you. Huh? He's just struggling. Same thing with the wife. You know, you have five, six, seven, eight, twenty kids. I mean, and then she's busy all day with kids, and you come home and the house is a wreck. And you think she doesn't love me because you don't keep the house. <laughs> you know, it's not that she don't love you. She's got a lot of things on her plate. She's got a little baby she's taking care of. My wife says, what were we thinking? We got five teenagers in our house. <laughs> I said, I don't think we were thinking. 
<laughs> it just happened. But you know what? Our teenagers aren't bad. Everybody else's teenagers are. They Because they always tell us they're bad. The worst people on the face of the earth are teenagers. <laughs> I said, well, we got five of the best teenagers I ever met. And they get along with each other. Not always. But most generally they do about 90% of the time. They, uh, they don't cause us a bunch of issues. Not a bunch of rebellious children. Huh? No. We, 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 uh, we get them in the scriptures. Huh? We believe in God. We, God's part of our family. And if you want to get rebellious, you better go talk to your father in heaven about it. <laughs> and we turn him on you. But again, a little lady gets a lot of things on her plate, and she, that husband comes home, and she doesn't have everything done that she'd like to have done. Maybe the dinner's not done yet, or the house isn't clean, dishes are still dirty. <laughs> the husband gets all upset and says, she don't love me, she don't take care of the house, what have you been doing all day? <laughs> huh? And as you see her just worn out, and the kids are just jumping all over the place like a bunch of monkeys, you know, in a zoo. <laughs> huh? it's, and it's not because she's not trying, trying her best. So I'm just telling you, it won't be what your expectations is. We're going to have the white picket fence, white little house with a nice flower garden in the front, and a vegetable garden in the back, and everything will be hunky-dory, and we're all going to be singing Kumbaya. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. <laughs> it, 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 and I'm talking to anybody in here. You'll find this out. <laughs> Amen. It don't work that way. But you know what? The expectations, though, the wicked will be slaughtered by God. His expectations shall perish. Uh, you, know, you know what the wicked's expectation is? To take America. Expectation is to destroy Israel. Expectation is, is to give the mark of the beast to all people on the face of the earth. And God's going to intervene in people's lives, and they're not going to take the mark. Expectation the wicked's going to perish. By the way, Satan is going to perish. Uh, and his devils are going to perish. The beast is going to perish. And the, and the false prophet is going to perish. These are all expectations of the wicked. Guess who's going to be standing? The righteous. The righteous is delivered out of trouble. And the wicked cometh in his stead. God's going, we're going to be in trouble and God's going to switch places. Let me give you an illustration of the Bible. Sennacherib comes to Hezekiah and says, You might as well go with me because I've destroyed everybody around us. You're the last. We're going to kill you too and everybody else. The whole nation of Judah is gone. You might as well figure your, pack your bags and come with us. That's what he's saying. We'll take you into captivity and we'll feed you dung in the field. Come on, let's go. And he goes to God, what do I say? Nothing. So he tells the people, say nothing. He prays with Isaiah. Isaiah and Hezekiah pray. And God brings a rumor to uh, Sennacherib. Sennacherib goes home. His son's slain. Guess what happened? The expectation of Sennacherib just perished. He didn't get to destroy Judah. Judah still was standing. You know, Judah is a small little nation. Israel was large. So were all the nations around them. Everybody got destroyed except this little nation. Guess what's standing today, Israel? If you look at Israel, it looks like a pinhead. Amongst all the Muslims over there. All the nations around them. As far as you can go from Africa. It's West Africa. All the way out to the Middle East. You know. Going toward the Persian Gulf and all that. And here's little Israel in the middle. They want that little piece of land. Everybody does. Where Jerusalem's at. And God says. Uh -uh. Your expectation's going to be destroyed. It's going to perish with you. Israel's still going to be there. From this time forward, Israel's going to be there. They can do all they want to try to destroy it. It isn't going to happen. Hmm. You say, how do you know? I read the end of the book. So the righteous will be delivered out of trouble, and the wicked cometh in his stead. Huh? That's what the Armageddon's about. Here comes Armageddon. God's going to chase them into the mountains and slay them. They're going to be running from God. Because you know he's got his vesture on and it's dipped in blood. And it says, King of kings, the Lord of lords on his vesture, written in blood. And it's the blood of the lamb and they're going to they're gonna flee from it. Why are they going to flee from it? How do they know that's the blood of the lamb? Because it's going to talk to them, I think. I think the blood of the lamb, gonna, they're going to look at it and say, Oh, this is a different blood than any other blood. Here we go. Huh? Here's something I want you to see real quick. 
So the hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth the neighbor, but the, through knowledge shall the just be delivered. Hypocrites, destroying your neighbor by living a hypocritical life, sending them to hell because you don't live as you speak. Huh? But through knowledge shall the just be delivered. You want to help them out? Then live by the knowledge of the word of God. When it goeth well with the righteous, the city rejoices. When the wicked perish, there is shouting. I was thinking about this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. It says that we're a city on the hill. You can't put out the, the city's light. The light in the city can't be put out. That's what we're supposed to be. And guess what? When you're that city, when the church is that city, when the people of God are like that city, then there's rejoicing. But when we start trying to hide that light that's supposed to be lighting up that city, then people start rising up against us. I believe that's what's happened in America. The churches have quit shining the light. Every time we hand out a track, it's a candle. It's a lantern. Every time we tell someone about the gospel, it's a lantern. It's a candle. It's light that we're shedding. It's light we're handing out. That's how we have to look at it. And then the, then the city would rejoice. There was a great rejoicing in our country. You know when... Um, uh, I remember when the Gulf War came about, uh, Desert Storm in the 1990-91. I'm going to tell you, churches started to, people started getting into church. Light was being handed out. The gospel was being preached. People started getting in there. They were fearing for life, death. They were thinking, oh, man, this is all over with. This is it. And we went over there and pounded them. I had video and video and video of this. And then we pounded uh, Baghdad, horribly pounded them. So much so, my brother-in-law says he was in Baghdad. When they went into Baghdad, uh, no, he went into Kuwait. When we went into Kuwait, he said uh, the people, the, the soldiers, raised their guns in the air and said, we surrender. You know what happened? Every day they got pounded with our, our forces. Every day. So much so, it didn't matter if they had ammunition or how many weapons they had. They didn't care anymore. They just wanted to surrender to get out of the battle. I know what the world will do. You keep pounding them with the gospel. <laughs> just keep going and going and going and going and going. And guess what? They'll surrender eventually. They'll say, man, my brother did that. My brother told me, he said, every day this guy would have preaching on his radio and and." Have seen this, he would put in uh, cassette tapes back in those days, cassette tapes of preaching and singing. And he said, I had, to, I had to carpool with this guy every day. You know, I have my brother, he got saved. I know why? Because God just kept giving it to him, giving it to him. Giving it. He was pounding his Kuwait and his Baghdad, amen. And eventually he says, I surrender. And he did. Huh? That's what he told me. He said, that, and you know what's funny about it? I was praying every day that God would bring the gospel to him. Pre preach to him again today, God. Tell him again today, God. I didn't know what was happening until he told me. When I witnessed to him personally, he told me that's what was happening. I said, praise the Lord. God had been answering my prayer, and I didn't even know it. Amen. And you know what's happening? That was a city, and the light wasn't put out. Blessing is upright. The city is exalted, but it's overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. By the way, that's happening in our nation today. So we need to, we need to, we need to set forth the light in the city. If anything, I'm going to end right there. We need to, we need to set forth the light. We need to put light out there. And it doesn't have to be you come on Saturday, you come on some other day and hand out trash. You can do it yourself. I mean, we'd like you to come on Saturday. If you can, come on Saturday. But don't, look at, hand them out every day. Carry a pocket of tracks. Uh, if you go in any of my vehicles, you'll find pocket full of tracks in the doors. <laughs> huh? Pocket full. I mean, the side pockets in the doors, full of tracks. I mean, hundreds of tracks. <laughs> huh? Amen. Why? Because we're carrying light with us. Uh -huh. And I really feel bad sometimes when we go to a restaurant and I go in there and I go, I forgot tracks. And I go, Rhonda, you got some? She checked. I don't have any either. Oh! One of our kids go, we want us to go out to the car and get some. Yes. <laughs> we forgot track. We forgot the light. And out the light. Man, how are we going to be a city on a hill? We put out the light or don't bring the light with us. How are people going to see it? You know what these churches are doing now? They don't have light. They look just like everybody else. 
I told my kids, I said, okay, let's say at night we turn out all the lights in the house. Not one light in the house. Nothing. Not even a refrigerator light. No night light or anything. And then I take a lighter and I just light it up. I said, you think you'll know where that lighter's at? They said, oh, well, yeah. That, we'll see it in the dark. It'll be the brightest thing in the dark. Exactly. That's what a city on a hill is supposed to be. This whole world's dark. The moon is a picture of, a, of the Christian. It's a reflection of the sun. That's what the moon is. And it lights up the night. And everybody can look up and say, look at the light. In fact, out at our place, when the moon's out and it's full and it's clear, except for the moon, guess what? It lights up like daylight out at our place. And you said, you, I don't need a flashlight. I can walk in the dark out there. Why? Because it's not real dark. Because there's a light in the sky that's reflecting the sun. That's what a Christian's supposed to be. We reflect the sun. We're supposed to light up the darkness. We're supposed to be a city on the hill. Guess what we're supposed to do? And you're not going to do it unless you're, in t you're walking in your integrity that's going to preserve you and lead your steps. You're going to have to have integrity. Man, we don't. Sometimes we just need to keep our mouth shut. Because it destroys the fact that we have no integrity. I mean, it actually reveals the fact we have none. Oh, we need to we need to pray for people. We need to pray for our church. I think a lot of things come into our church, and we got our integrity was squelched. Our light was put out under the guise that we're helping you. Told my, I told my kids today, I said, you know how bad this world's getting? Even Christians can't figure out what's right and wrong anymore. That's why we have to have this book, and we have to look in it and say, okay, where do I step? I'm not making another step till I find out where the right step is. It's that bad. Where even Christians are making wrong decisions, the good Christians making wrong decisions because they think this is the right decision. That's how sneaky the devil is. He's the most subtle beast of the field. And he'll make you think that this decision is the right decision. What do you think Joel Osteen's about? Kenneth Copeland or, or uh, Hagee. These guys are all wicked. Even, even some people think, well, what is his name? Uh, he got caught in adultery in the 80s, and, and now he's preaching again. His son, his son preaches. and What is his name? Uh, not, not Jimmy Baker. Jimmy Baker was a wolf and it's Han Tammy Faye Baker but I'm trying to think of his name but he uh, he he he's been caught it's Jimmy Swagger or yeah Jimmy Swagger oh what a heathen what a wicked man huh and, and by the way he preaches out of the King James Bible don't let that deceive you uh, Jehovah's Witnesses use the King James Bible uh, they'll tell you they'll break it out if you're King James Huh? Mormons will break out a King James Bible. <laughs> Don't let that deceive you. Satan will deceive you. Someone's unknowing. And it's getting even getting worse than that. Even more mature Christians are trying to figure out which way is the right way. Well, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, help us understand what we heard. God, I pray you get glory out of it all. Lord, in our life, I pray you help us. Help us to be aware, spiritually aware. Walking in the Spirit. It's the only way we're going to understand things, right from wrong, is spiritually. To walk in that flesh, Lord, we'll choose wrong every time. God, I pray you help us. Help us to walk in our integrity. Help us to be balanced in everything that we do. God, let us be a just balance. Teach us how to be. Teach us the Word of God as we grow. And Lord, I remember when I was a younger Christian, I couldn't, I couldn't learn fast enough. I wanted to learn, 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 learn. Not that I don't want to learn anymore. It's just that I was just impatient about learning. Lord, if we feel that way, that's really a good thing. But let us not get ahead of you. Let us wait on you and learn at the speed you want us to learn. God, will give you the praise and honor and glory. Help us to be about studying the Word of God and reading it, preaching it and teaching it. And if we got the Word in our mind and our hearts and if we're we're really learning, Lord. We should teach others. Bring the gospel to them. Bring the word to them. And help people. God, I just pray that you do this to your glory and praise and honor. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed.